Short-circuiting God's plan can take you far away from your home in Christ. But thank God that His grace always calling you to come home. Whenever I try to short-circuit God's plans in my life, I go through unnecessary pain and discontentment. Short-circuiting and shortcuts never works for me, and I know they don't work for you either. In the last message, chapter 1, verses 19, 20, and 21, we saw Naomi experiencing a great deal of embarrassment by her former neighbor and her former relatives in Bethlehem. And she went back and she said, don't call me Naomi, pleasant, call me bitter, Mara. In the second half of verse 3, look at it, and if you have your Bible, underline it. The second half of verse 3. As it happened, who made it happen? The sovereign God. Ruth found herself gleaning in the fields of Boaz. Why? Beloved, the Scripture from cover to cover affirm the sovereignty of God. Even in the situations that are inexplicable, even in circumstances that do not make any sense to us whatsoever, it makes sense to God. See, when Paul said in Romans 8, 28, which we glibly kind of quoted a lot, <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> this verse in 8, 28, in all things, how many of those things Paul's talking about? All, all things for, for the believer. That's just for the believer, to those who love him. Make sure you read the rest of the verse. When he says all things, he meant just that, all things. Not just some things, not just the bits that we like, <laughs> uh, not just the points uh, that we prefer, not just uh, the areas where we are comfortable. No, no. He says all things. How many things? God is cooperating. That's really the literal translation of the word. God is is bending things around. He is twisting and doing and working and, and doing several things on maybe 2,000 fronts, not just one or two, for the good, according to his foreknowledge. Look with me again at verse 3. As it turned out, as it turned out, who made it turn out? Not as luck would have it, no. The gracious sovereign, heavenly Father. And that is why the writer for the book of Ruth, he does not wait till chapter 3 to introduce Bowers. He introduces Bowers in chapter 2, very early on. <laughs> there is wisdom in that. But what is even far, far, far more important than that is that Bowers turned out to be, as we say in the South, a kinfolk. He's a kinfolk. <laughs> And my beloved friends, this is the first clear indication that God is working behind the scenes to bring great things out of the pain and the suffering and the trials. Don't ever forget that in your darkest moment you are favored by God. And so Ruth, who's a Gentile, don't you ever forget that Gentile? She's a Gentile. And you know the animosity. She's a Gentile. But she was discipled in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, by her mother-in-law, Naomi. Because in that very action of going out and gleaning, there is a knowledge of the Scripture, particularly Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. And I'm going to read it word for word because I don't want to mess that. It's so important. Listen carefully. God speaking to the landlords, the farmers, those who own the land, just like Boaz and those before him. Here's what God is saying. When you reap the harvest 
of your land. You shall not totally reap the corners of the fields, nor shall you gather the gleaning of the harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And so young Ruth followed the Scripture that was taught to her by her mother-in-law. And she goes out as a stranger, as a foreigner, to glean from the field of Boaz, as luck would have it, right? <laughs> Boaz is a kinsman. What is a kinsman? Well, in the Old Testament, the concept of family is a whole lot more than we now refer to the nuclear family. The, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more. It's, it's, it's basically anybody who's your blood relative is a family. The family was the basic unit of Israelite social and kinship relationship. And so Boaz inquires who this strange woman, Ruth, who was gleaning in his field, and when they told him who she was, he said, in effect, oh, yes, 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 yes. This is the faithful daughter-in-law of Naomi. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember hearing about her selflessness, who sacrificed leaving her family and her home to be a blessing to her mother-in-law. Oh, yes, this is the one I have been hearing about who has left all to be with her mother-in-law, Naomi. In verses 8, 9, and 10 is where you actually see the engine room of God's grace. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's where, where grace is working. Because it was compassion. It was compassion that motivated Boaz and meets Ruth at the point of her need. It was compassion that caused Jesus to leave the glories of heaven and come to earth. It was compassion that makes our Lord continuously, constantly meeting us at our point of needs. There, there is more. There's a whole lot more. Ruth calls herself a foreigner. That's what she called herself. But Boaz called her a daughter. Did you get that? She calls herself a foreigner. He calls her daughter. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were strangers and foreigners from God, He called us His children. When we were at enmity with God, He called us sons and daughters. When we were in a state of rebellion against God, He called you a friend. When you and I were totally unaware of God's love, His love reached out for our hurt and for our pain. Look at how the kinsman redeemer treated this faithful Ruth. First of all, he sweeps away all of the doubt regarding her being a kinsman. Then he gives her the run of the field, not just those corners and not just the gleaning, no. The whole field is hers. Then he offers her protection. Then he offers her water to drink, not during the break time, just during the break time, but any time she wants to. Ah, <laughs> oh, but this is just the beginning. This is just a token of the grace. The rest is <laughs> yet to come. It will going to follow the abundance of grace. And beloved, I am convinced with every ounce of my being as I'm standing here before you that God wants to pour His grace. He wants to pour His blessings upon His children, but only if they're faithful. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. You see, like Abraham, and don't you ever forget, Abraham was a pagan before God appeared to him. He was a pagan worshiper. He's an idol worshiper. Ruth was pagan, Moabite. And like pagan Abraham, in obedience, left home and family to follow God's call. She leaves home and follows Naomi, but she more follows Naomi's God. Ruth chapter 2 is an amazing picture, so I want to explanify it for you, okay? Uh, okay, I want you to use your imagination, because without using your imagination, you miss out on an incredible blessing. Just think of yourself 
as a temporary worker in a big company or minimum wage earner. And then all of a sudden, you hear on the PA system in the company, John Smith, come to the receptionist. You're calling my name. Why is that? In this case, it was Ruth the Moabite. <laughs> come to the receptionist. I mean, you're half worried and you're half excited. Uh, you don't know what's, why they're calling your name and you don't know why. It's, uh, uh, have you done anything wrong? Are you going to get sacked? Or what's going to happen? And so nervously you go and say, well, I am John Smith. I'm Ruth the Moabite. At that point they tell you that you are invited to have lunch in the executive suite with the CEO of the company. Huh? Hello. You're speechless. You're stunned. You're almost fainting from feeling giddy and surprised and, and, and all of the emotions that go through inside of you. This is what happened here in Ruth chapter 2. While Ruth, still basking in this glow of, of, of having lunch with the boss, <laughs> he says to her, but that's not all. That's not all. Eat all you want, and then you're going to have a doggy bag for your mother-in-law. Except they didn't call it doggy bag then. You have enough food to eat, and then take as much as you can, or as much as you want to, for Naomi, your mother-in-law. Oh, Ruth. Oh, Ruth. <laughs> but this is just the beginning. The abundant life is coming. The blessing is coming. The doors of heaven have not opened wide yet. The best is yet to come. The abundance of blessings is yet to come. Uh, the windows of heaven are yet to be opened wide. The Bible said that God moves us from one point of glory into another. Can I get an amen? amen. Watch this. First, Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi is where it all began. That's where it all began. Then her faith in the Lord God of Israel, the God of Naomi, verse 12, is far more central even in Boaz's thinking. Boaz sought to compensate her abundantly for the losses and the sacrifices that she has made. Oh, but that's only a small deposit. This is just a deposit. This is a tiny deposit in comparison to the abundance that God is about to bring into her life. In chapter 3 and 4 of the book of Ruth, we're going to see that. We're going to see that overwhelming abundance of the grace of God. But that's only if I'm not going to levitate. I mean, I'm excited thinking about it. <laughs> Look with me at the amazing provision of God. Verse 13 all the way to 23. Ruth responds to Bauer's graciousness. is very important. Listen to me. This is a role model for all of us of how we respond to the grace of God. Your response to God's graciousness with you is of vital importance. Jesus tells us that he watches to see when he gives us small blessings, little blessings, small deposits, and he watches how faithful you are with that little that he's given you, how faithful you are, how faithful you are, how faithful you are. And then he says that he who is faithful with little will be faithful in much. So he begins to enlarge your tent. He begins to enlarge your territory. He begins to bless you abundantly. Beloved, this is a biblical principle. I'm not making it up. It's not my idea. He who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. I am absolutely amazed when I hear some people say, Oh, when my ships come to harbor, I will do thus and thus. You kidding me? You've never sent any ships out. <laughs> How are you going to expect ships coming to the harbor? Verse 13, Boaz is moved by Ruth's humility. I believe with all my heart. 
God is moved by humility and gratitude and thankfulness. She said, you are most gracious to me, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I'm not one of your servants. Ruth was happy to settle for a servant-master relationship. She was ready to settle for that, but that's not how God treats us. He said, I no longer call you servant. I call you what? Friends. She saw herself as unworthy of the grace that she received. Look with me at Bowers' response to her humility, verses 15 and 16. He goes way beyond what is required by the law of God to an amazing grace. He goes beyond his duties. Beloved, that's why it's called overwhelming grace. Amazing grace means it is mind-boggling. He has gone beyond the letter of the law to let love fulfill the law. Hear me right, please. Bauer's overwhelming generosity demonstrated the character of God as he revealed it in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to imagine this. Imagine with me. When Ruth comes home to tell Naomi what happened at work this morning. <laughs> Naomi, I can't wait to tell you what happened at work today. Naomi, of course, immediately realizes that Yahweh's hand in working in this marvelous provision. She immediately sees, sees Yahweh's hand. Verse 20. This was a confirmation to Naomi that her God has not despised her, that her God had not forgotten her, that her God had not forsaken her, that her God is rewarding her for coming home. And you heard me talk about that last message. She came home, and God is going to bless her coming home. God is blessing her for returning home to his people and his land. God wants to bless his children in the community of faith. God wants to bless his children when they belong to the body of Christ. God loves to bless his children if they're not separating themselves uh, from the body of believers. God always wants to bless his children who expresses their commitment to him and to his church. I can only imagine how Naomi mind was racing. <laughs> Imagine her hearing that story, and her mind was going a million miles old. I mean, in, in a minute. She said, Bowers? Did you say Bowers? Did I hear you correctly? His name is Bowers? <laughs> is that his name, Bowers? Verse 20. Yeah. That's our relative. He's our kinsman redeemer. Ruth! You're not only granted provision of food for the rest of the harvest season, but for the rest of your life. Ruth, you're not only temporary blessed, but all of your future is blessed. Ruth, you're not only counted among Boaz's workers, you're a friend. Ruth, you are not only blessed for now, <laughs> but you will become the human ancestor of the Messiah. Obed, Jesse, David, all going to come from you all the way to Jesus. My beloved, this is God's blessing of salvation. He's not only promised to never leave you nor forsake you, but he promised to guide you all the way home to heaven. God's blessing of salvation is not only to forgive you all of your sins here and now, but to keep you safe for all of eternity. 
God's blessing of salvation, not only that will make you not longer a stranger, but you become a son and a daughter. <laughs> but you, not only that, you're going to inherit everything Jesus inherits. God's blessings for your salvation will keep you protected, and it's going to keep you protected even from your own foolish decisions. He will keep you protected even if you are prone to wander away from Him. will keep you protected from your ingratitude to His grace and blessing. He will keep you protected from being preoccupied with His blessings and ignoring Him, even when you're focusing on the wrong things, if, even when you are indifferent toward the Lord, even when you uh, attempt to, to get out from under His wings and His shadow, His security for you is indisputable. Please hear me right. One thing that's going to lift you out of the depth of your pain, whatever pain you're going through, one thing that will lift you up from whatever circumstances that are weighing you down is when you realize that you are an imitator of your kinsman redeemer. You are an imitator of your kinsman redeemer. Therefore, what you and I need to do and must do, should do, have no option but to do, is to express grace towards somebody else is to express grace to someone whom we think they're not worthy, <laughs> to see your blessings as something to be used to bless God and His work, not just for you. Let me conclude by sharing the prayer of John Wesley. This is a prayer that John Wesley prayed on a regular basis. Let me do all the good I can to all the people I can, by all means I can, as often as I can, for I shall not pass this way again. Be an imitator of your kinsman redeemer by demonstrating the character of God, the God whom Ruth came to believe in and worship, 